Hello and welcome to the programme, I'm Ben Thompson and this week we're in Abu Dhabi at the region's largest defence show. Over the next few days big money will change hands here as governments in this region re-equip their military. But in the wake of unrest in Tunisia and Egypt and now Libya, Yemen and Bahrain, how that equipment is being used is being watched more closely than ever before. So is it money well spent? We'll be finding out. Also coming up this week... Counting the cost in Cairo, as Egypt slowly gets back to work, we assess the impact of the unrest on the country's economy. The contagion spreads. Bahrain, Yemen and Libya now face political and economic turmoil. Should the rest of the Gulf be worried? And can you make a fortune in Fez, how the global recession took its toll on Morocco's booming property market? But first, as Egypt slowly gets back to work, it's counting the cost of weeks of unrest. Many businesses were forced to close and staff walked out on strike. The stock market there is still closed after more than three weeks and there's no sign of it reopening yet until political or economic stability returns. So just how can Egypt regain that stability? I've been in Cairo to find out. Egypt is getting back to work. After weeks of protest and unrest that brought the country and the economy to a standstill. This factory, two hours from Cairo, makes BYD cars. The parts are shipped from China and assembled here. In a typical month, it turns out around 800 cars. But February wasn't a typical month. The factory was forced to close altogether at the height of the unrest. And it's now paying its staff overtime to make up the lost sales. But despite the difficulties and the extra cost, the factory's manager has been keen to support his workers. He too shares their hopes about what the future might hold. Everything must be changed. The, just the mentality, the thinking, the, everything around the, the, the country must change. We want to build our, our factory, we want to build our country. So this will be by more and more work. To, by increase the produ productivity. So by this way, we, we can change the position of our company and the position of our country in the, in the, in the Middle East, in the all of the Middle East. And take a drive around here, and it's easy to see why, for many, that change can't come soon enough. This is a queue for bread that's subsidized by the government, but demand for it is high. As the cost of food rises, more and more families are relying on handouts like this. But lifting Egypt out of poverty isn't easy. One fifth of the population here lives on less than a dollar a day. But with a lack of jobs and opportunities, few have the chance to work their way out of poverty. A new political and economic direction may help Egypt, but that change won't come overnight. Getting the country and its economy back on track will take time. People will be willing to be a little more patient with a truly democratic regime. I mean, the trouble with the previous regime is that it did not only impoverish the people, but it also oppressed them. So this mixture of oppression and impoverishment was unbearable, intolerable. And actually, this is one of the main social and political mechanisms that led to the revolution. But I think people would be a lot more patient with a truly democratic regime and they would take solace from the fact that they have a truly democratic regime that aims at their interests even if there is some delay in, in them reaping concrete uh, benefits in terms of standard of living. But whilst Egypt and its workers have now found their voice, that also poses a challenge for business. Those demanding change in the country's politics have now turned their attention to the country's economics too. There's a new spirit among the youth, and this energy can be used to make Egypt better. As a developing country, we need this spirit to reach our goals step by step. People went out to protest because they have been frustrated for many years. The changes that took place broke the fear, and they are now going out to claim their rights. But back at the car factory, the staff are keen to work. 
Before President Mubarak left, many here felt they had little control over their lives. But just two weeks after his resignation, there is a real feeling here that for the first time in a long time, they are the ones who will determine their future. So that's the view from Cairo. But the unrest that began in Egypt and Tunisia is now spreading. This week, there were violent protests in Iran, Yemen, Libya, Bahrain and Morocco. And whilst on the surface, the protesters' demands seem to be very similar, the underlying problems are very different. So just how can governments in this region tackle the underlying issues? It's a question I put to the legal expert, Amar Abedat. The differences are huge. Uh, from one country, it could be uh, complete fed up of the regime. The people uh, do not want to tolerate any further. And regardless what changes are introduced to them, the people have already taken the decision. It's too late to come up with a magical uh, uh, formula of I'll approve all your demands. Whereas in other countries, the issues are uh, specific to amendment of a uh, uh, legislation regulating uh, elections, amendment of uh, uh, the way uh, go governments are chosen, and so on. So uh, we cannot put uh, the uh, Arab countries all into one pot. These protests organised through the internet, through social media, there's a big change in how things are done in this part of the world. We've seen governments forced to react to things that they've never had to deal with before. There is an obvious gap in communicating between the people and the government. The governments need to change the way they deal with their people. They, they need to understand that uh, the uh, traditional uh, uh, government-owned uh, news networks and, and television broadcasters are, do no longer have an audience. Should the Gulf be worried that it could face similar protests? If you look at the uh, global indices for uh, uh, corruption, uh, you'll find that the GCC states rate quite uh, favorably. So the, m the more you have uh, uh, corruption in a state, the more vulnerable your country will be for changing of regimes or for de demonstrations or for riots. Uh, and I think uh, that we've seen the example of Bahrain, where the government wisely opened the dialogue quickly, addressing the, uh, uh, the political and democratic demands of the people in order to, to reach an amicable solution. So I think going ahead, what is next. Uh, it's not the real question is not which country, but the real uh, question would be how to deal with uh, the people moving forward. Omar Abedat speaking to me earlier. Now it seems that military spending and the Gulf go hand in hand. In fact, six of the world's top 10 spenders on military hardware relative to their size are here in the Middle East from Saudi Arabia to Israel and even the relatively peaceful countries like the UAE and Oman. They're all spending big re-equipping their armies, navies and air forces with the latest equipment. But in light of the unrest right across this region, just what that equipment is being used for is being watched more closely than ever. So who's spending and why? Philip Hampshire is in Abu Dhabi to find out. Whether you're looking for a car to survive a mortar attack or a gun from Azerbaijan designed to shoot such heavily armoured vehicles, the place to be to do your shopping is IDEX, the international defence exhibition in Abu Dhabi. In just a few years it's moved from being the new kid on the block to one of the most important military exhibitions in the world. With Middle Eastern countries now the top spenders on defence per capita, it may soon even become the most important trade show of the lot. While we talk of Tier 1 and we talk of Farnborough or the Paris Air Show, the Dubai Air Show and the IDEX show that precedes it are very fast moving up into that same rank. Uh, partly it's because of the easy air links and the easy quality of life here. I mean, you know, very high standard of performance. But this shift in focus for the industry to the Middle East is a more complicated affair than you might think. It's closely tied to the Gulf's push to diversify economies away from oil. Take the Mbombe. It's a low-profile, flat-based troop carrier. But while this initial prototype hails from South Africa, 
It's being brought here to the United Arab Emirates as part of a joint venture with a local company, International Golden Group. And eventually, they hope these vehicles will be built right here in the United Arab Emirates for the Middle Eastern market. The UAE today is a serious procurer of, of equipment and technology, and it stands to reason that the government has a serious desire to create competence internally. It's taken a long time for the international defense industry to realize that this is no longer an optional extra. And slowly but surely, major defense contractors are starting to get used to the idea of manufacturing where the market is. And the Mbombe isn't alone. Just a few stands away is Nima, the Humvee-style vehicle with a similar pedigree. Nima Automotive is a defense automotive manufacturer based in Abu Dhabi with a mandate to manufacture wheeled armored vehicles. Yes, Gulf states are buying military hardware, but if it isn't at least in part built locally, you'll find your sales pitch a much tougher affair. So while these remote-controlled robots are built in the United States, they're marketed in conjunction with a local business. Eventually, this leads to technology transfer and local companies getting to a level where they can compete on the international stage on their own. Companies like Caracal. These handguns and sniper rifles are designed and built locally, with youth unemployment in the Arab Emirates at around 20% and more kids entering the labor force every year home-based companies are needed to provide jobs. Now that's not to say there isn't space at this event for the major multinationals. Raytheon's showing off Vertsim, it's a virtual training system for soldiers. It's like taking a computer game up several notches to the point where you're totally immersed in the environment you're fighting in. Well, come on, you can't expect me to come all this way and not go and have a try. The sounds are real and so's the adrenaline. It's provided by that big pack on your back. Get shot and you'll get a nasty electric shock. The software allows a Delta Force or SAS team to train on sensitive sites like the White House or embassy sieges without ever entering the building. It also allows rookies like me to experience combat without the risk of death. Well, in the real world anyway. It all means that the IDEX defense show will only grow in importance. So the next time you're in the market for a remote-controlled helicopter that absolutely positively has to be shaped like a flying shark, you'll know where to do your shopping. Philip Hampshire reporting from Abu Dhabi there. Now it's time for us to take a short break now, but when we come back, can you make a fortune in Fez? We look at how the recession stalled Morocco's unlikely property boom. Welcome back to the programme. I'm Ben Thompson and this week we're in Abu Dhabi at the region's largest defence show. Now events over the past few weeks here in the Middle East will go down as the defining moments of this region's development. But what happens next? Egypt and Tunisia are trying to rebuild both politically and economically. But where do they start? Well, Iraq may be an extreme example, but it too has experienced regime change and it's trying to get its economy back on track. So what lessons can Tunisia and Egypt learn from Iraq? A question I put to Erin Miller-Rankin of the law firm Freshfield. The contrast with places such as Iraq and Libya, are there, are, these are countries who have for a long time been, been vilified in the Western media in particular. There's a huge fear factor to overcome generally uh, in the market and with investors. Uh, there's also, in, in many cases, issues with uh, the rule of law uh, and not having signed on to certain international agreements and accords by which the rest of the world does business. Uh, if you have places like Egypt and, and Bahrain, for example, these places have been open for business for years. Major transactions have been conducted there. They're real players with real resources. Um, and while current instability will shake the market a bit, um, I think it will be harder for them to undo a, a good reputation earned over the years. For example, in Bahrain, it's a transport hub. Um, you know, it's, it made a commitment a long time ago to diversify its economy. The projects that are being undertaken there reflect that. Egypt continuing to play to its strengths in, in uh, steel and cement production as well as of course the Suez Canal and the ports. Um, people will want it to do well, Egypt particularly given its geopolitical importance. 
How worried should international firms be about the changing legal landscape, specifically if they've invested time, money and resources in a country that then goes through massive political or economic change? It's a huge concern. Uh, the issue usually does come down to enforcement because with a contract, of course, you can have a governing law that's elsewhere. You can do a project in Libya that's governed by UK law. Uh, but the issue is, uh, you know, what happens when you go to enforce? Uh, and that's where you usually run into problem. If, they're, if they haven't signed on to things like the New York Convention, you have a problem on your hands, you have a paper judgment. So that's when it's, that's when it's difficult. Or things like if you have secured assets, but then there isn't the legislation to allow you to exercise your security over the assets. So these are very much front of mind. What should be at the top of many companies' to-do list now, if they're operating in countries like Libya, what should they be looking at? Companies that feel that the, the future viability of their business in that country is at risk uh, need to sit down and, and evaluate whether they, whether they are going to have to disengage from being in that country, and if so, how can they do that within the limits of the law and the limits of their contracts? I mean, most contracts have clauses that deal with major game-changing events. Um, it has a fancy legal title, but that, that's basically what it involves. And, I think ensuring that it, the company's employees are, are fine in situations where the security situation is a bit precarious, securing the assets that they have uh, in the country while things are a bit difficult, and then evaluating next steps. Uh, and I think a lot of that is simply going to have to be a wait and see approach to see uh, how the governments recover, what comes into place afterwards, and how, how or if that changes things. And then in situations like to take a, a bad scenario, if there was expropriation, what options are available under international treaties to recover the damages caused by that? Now, up until a few years ago, Fez in Morocco was one of this region's biggest property hotspots. Many Westerners flocked there to snap up property at bargain prices, renovate it and make a profit. But with a financial crisis, that stampede grounds to a halt, leaving many disappointed buyers and sellers so is there still money to be made in Morocco? Jeremy Howell is in Fez to find out. This is the standard of accommodation for hundreds of Moroccans who live in the old town in Fez. Ladia Hayat's house has been in her family for five generations, but she can't afford to renovate it. She's desperate to sell up and move out. I don't want to leave the old town, she says, but I don't have the money to restore this house. I plan to sell it and buy a modern flat in the new town, which doesn't need maintenance. The kind of people who've been snapping up houses in Fez's old town are Europeans like Jim Couture from France. He and his wife are renovating this courtyard villa, or Riyadh, into a guest house. This is really a project I've wanted to do for the whole of my life, to get a place like this and turn it into a guest house. It's a personal project. It'll be my livelihood. It's not a shot at making profits from speculation like it's been for others. I wanted a change of life for me, my wife and my children in this country, which we love. Fez has the largest Medina, or Old Quarter, in the Arab world some 9,000 houses. From the mid-2000s, its souks and lanes started to attract more and more Western tourists, especially Britons, who, helped by the strength of the pound, started snapping up cheap properties and restoring them. Europeans started coming to Fez to attain their dream of living life in the winding alleyways of an ancient Arabian city. The people who lived here were more than happy to sell to them to attain their dream of moving out into a modern flat in the suburbs. It was a lucrative switch while it lasted because property prices increased threefold. The house renovation industry in Fez swung into action. It was a golden time for local builders. But then came the global economic crisis and the fall of the pound sterling. Prices peaked in 2008, and many who'd bought in Fez with a quick resell in mind were left with unwanted property. We had this kind of buyer, and that's not the kind of uh, buyer we really like in Fez, because Fez is much more than coming to do speculation. And uh, it didn't work in Fez. The economy is not based only on uh, property in Fez. The economy is based on long-term uh, tourism development. So that's where there are uh, plenty of opportunities. During the property gold rush in Fez, the government started fretting. The influx of foreigners and exodus of local people would rob the Medina of its character. 
It set up a fund to help Moroccan residents restore their properties to this kind of state. This is the house of Fatima Al-Fahimi, head of the Government Restoration Agency. She and other local residents earn money from their houses by renting out rooms in them to tourists. They used to make a profit from selling up their houses here and then buying a flat and also buying a shop or something. But nowadays they prefer to hang on to these houses, which have been in their families for generations, and at the same time they can earn an income from them to live off. So far, 25 families in Fez Medina have taken government money to restore their houses. They might still want to sell to foreigners, but there are very few buyers in the market compared to before. The property market in Fez is no longer the route to instant riches, either for Moroccan sellers or for Western buyers who are looking to flip. But the tourism sector in this town seems set for steady growth, and so there may be some change in investing in the guest house market for a moderate income and maybe also for moderate increases in the value of property. Jeremy Howell reporting from Fez there. Now our time is very nearly up for this week, but before we go, here's a quick look at how the region's major markets finished. And don't forget our email address, as always, is middleeastbiz at bbc.co.uk. Do drop us an email with any thoughts, comments or suggestions you might have for the programme. You can also keep up to date with us during the week at Twitter and Facebook. There you'll find photos, updates and news from the BBC's business teams right around the world. Now next week we'll be in Israel looking at an escalating row between an American firm and the Israeli government about just who owns the rights to a major new gas reserve found off the coast of Israel. But until then, from me, Ben Thompson and the rest of the team, thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. Thank you.